Hi there, and welcome to London's Heathrow Airport, where I am currently experiencing one of the bigger reality checks of the year. You see, this flight is flight 404 to get me from Vietnam to Greece, and I just stepped off of an incredible first-class flight in Etihad's A380 apartments. And now, I'm connecting to a Aegean Air in economy class. At least it's not Ryanair, I suppose. I was pretty wrong about Aegean Airlines, though, not gonna lie. That woes me attitude that I had as I boarded the 14-year-old airplane probably had something to do with it. But as I'll show you today, Aegean might just be Europe's dark horse when it comes to airlines. I landed in Terminal 4, but that's not where my next flight departs from. Luckily, at least, we have some beautiful scenery along the way. Heathrow currently has five sprawling terminals, well, kinda five, and I'm heading to Terminal 2, Heathrow's Star Alliance hub, aka the Queen's Terminal. You can transfer between any of the terminals airside by bus. The whole process is painless and quick. As we head to T2, let me welcome any of you that are new to the channel. My name is Kevin, and I am the Flip Flop Traveler. I think the internet is in need of a whole lot more honesty when it comes to airline and hotel content, and that's why I'm here. I just want to be real with you. I make trip reports and high-end hotel reviews, and I always self-fund my trips. In fact, you'll always be able to find the exact price that I paid in the description below. I didn't alert Aegean Airlines that I'd be filming because I want as normal of an experience as possible. So in this video today, I'm going to give you nothing more than my own personal, honest, and unbiased opinion based on my own experience. Etihad and Aegean are in no way affiliated, so I was connecting with a totally separate ticket. But I didn't have any checked bags, so I was hoping that I wouldn't need to enter the UK, which was the case. When going through immigration transfer security, they'll ask you for your onwards boarding pass, which I had on my phone and I was led straight through. Note though, I did the same process more recently and didn't have my boarding pass, and they still let me through after showing my emailed itinerary. Once through immigration security, you'll be let into the terminal itself, which has all of the transfer desks for Star Alliance, if you did need to pick up a boarding pass. The Queen's Terminal was opened in 2014 and replaced the original Terminal 2, which was the oldest of all of Heathrow's terminals when demolished. I should mention that Terminal 1 hasn't been in use since 2015, and it will eventually make way for Terminal 2's expansion, but the full demolition was meant to take like 5-10 to 10 years for some reason so its linked baggage infrastructure is still being partially used, or so random sources on the internet say. This terminal is made of two buildings at the moment. The head house where we are now serves all of the short haul traffic for Star Alliance, and the separate satellite terminal handles all of the longer intercontinental services. I am Star Alliance Gold, and I could have made my way to the satellite to visit one of the quote-unquote nicer lounges, but I was a little bit exhausted, so I decided to stay here and head to the Lufthansa Lounge instead. Looking very German today, aren't we? In the end, it was a wise decision, because this lounge, especially the Senator Lounge, was quite pleasant with a decent spread of food. Lufthansa is one of the few airlines which operates outstation lounges which divide access by status and class of service. The business class lounge is accessible more or less by anyone with a Star Alliance business class ticket. The Senator Lounge though, which they consider of a higher level, is only accessible by passengers with Star Alliance status. If you have Star Alliance Gold, it's fantastic. Here's your friendly reminder to please click that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with friends and family. Those are truly the easiest ways, all free for you, to support the channel. If you'd like to support me further, my Patreon is linked in the description below. Thanks very much in advance. From the perspective of the guy writing this script, Aegean has a refreshingly simple history. Let's head to the gate and quickly talk about it. They began with domestic Greek service in 1999, that same year buying out Air Greece. In 2010, they attempted to merge with Olympic Air, but were blocked by the EU for the near monopoly that they'd have on the Greek market. That same year, they became part of the Star Alliance. 
A few years later, with Olympic Air hanging on by a thread, they attempted to acquire them and were successful at doing so. The projection that Olympic Air may have gone bankrupt without the acquisition anyway. The brands were kept separate, and these days, Olympic Air flies all turboprops on many of Greece's public service obligation routes within Greece. Meanwhile, Aegean now have 60 aircraft in the fleet, with 22 more on order. They are a fully Airbus narrowbody fleet with A320s and A321s. One piece that I was a bit shocked to discover, though, was that they fly to a staggering 118 destinations. Sure, some of them are seasonal, but for a smaller regional airline that doesn't fly a single long-haul route and isn't well-located for connecting services, that's pretty damn impressive. We were heading out of gate A26 today, at the end of the concourse tucked around the corner. The boarding process was well organized with plenty of stanchions so different boarding groups could queue up. But the one thing that annoyed me is that they forced every single passenger to gate check any bag with wheels, citing the fact that the flight was full. While it's normal for gate agents to ask for volunteers to gate check their bags due to heavy loads, I've never once seen an airline force every single roller bag to be checked. We started to board, but then we were held back as there was an issue with the jet bridge. Perhaps all of those gate check bags were weighing it down. As we started boarding for real this time, we got our first proper look at today's 14-year-old Seagull. Let's take a look at today's flight stats. Calling it a Seagull since that's what their livery is meant to represent. The new one and the old one. Stepping on board, I had a surprisingly cheerful greeting by two flight attendants who were handing out hard candies as everyone boarded. Aegean currently have four different A321 configurations, this one having five rows of Euro business class followed by economy. At first glance, the cabin looks pretty tired and dated, but I quickly realized that this had more to do with a poor choice of fabric color than anything else. The seats themselves, while certainly not cutting edge, were perfectly fine and were just as comfortable as any other slimline European economy seat. I paid $26 extra for this exit row seat, and while I had a sore neck from trying to look out the window, I was happy to have all of the extra legroom and easy access to the aisle. We pushed back a bit late and had a view of many of the big birds at Terminal 3. I swear that anytime I transit through London, it's beautiful and clear. But God forbid I actually enter the country, it's dreary and soggy. I suppose that's just the London way? We would taxi to the northeast corner of the airport, passing by the satellite terminal of Terminal 2 along the way. All the while, the flight attendants performed the safety demonstration. If you head down to the description, you'll find my next 5 videos to come out, as well as other bits and pieces like the soundtrack titles featured in this video. On your way down there, don't forget to subscribe. I release full-length videos every Thursday and Saturday. Sit back and relax, the spool up, take off and airport stats are coming up next.
once up in the air, the overhead monitors flipped down and showed the moving map throughout the flight, which I appreciated. Aegean recently announced that they'll soon have free Wi-Fi for all of their miles and bonus members in the aircraft with such equipment, of course. On our track southeast, we crossed over France, Switzerland, Italy, and Albania. Soon after takeoff, a small dinner service was served. For quite a while now, I've been seeing posts about Aegean Airlines' really good food, albeit usually from business class, so I was just curious as to what we'd get. The choice was a pasta dish with either chicken or vegetables. I will fully admit, it looks like an overcooked slab of I don't know what, served up with a cup of random veg. But this was actually really tasty. They're not winning any Michelin stars up here, but they do know how to season food, and quite frankly, that's like 88% of the battle. Soon after finishing up the meal service, we crossed over the southwestern corner of the Alps. Okay, I need to talk about the crew on this flight. They were outstanding, and I honestly cannot remember the last time that I saw a crew hustle like they did on a flight of this length. They passed through the cabin a whopping five or six times. I honestly lost count. Once was the meal service, once was for a small treat after the meal, and the rest were all full drink services. It was actually hilarious because you really needed to be prepared to get their attention and quickly communicate your order because they literally never stopped the brakes on the cart. They continuously moved. Some of you might be put off by the rush nature of things, but I thought it was absolutely magnificent. And mind you, they were doing all of this while what seemed like 30% of the passengers were standing in the aisle at all times. This was essentially how it was the entire flight but I didn't really mind since I had cookies and four refills of wine. And then soon enough, we were approaching the Balkan Peninsula. All of this wrapping up pretty quickly as the flight attendants were passing through the aisle. Night set in and soon we were on our final approach. That's the port of Piraeus, just under the wing with Athens in the distance. So when it comes to three hour economy, narrow body flights, I don't think I've ever said, I can't wait to try it again. But with the Gian, I honestly can't wait to try it again. My own ignorance is probably the reason for not knowing how extensive their network is. But I think it's reasonable to not have known how good of an airline a Gian is. They're just not huge and their niche, and I just hope they don't change a thing. I really do hope that you enjoyed this regional trip report today. If you did, please be sure to click that thumbs up button and subscribe for two new full-length videos each week. I'll see you next time from the Intercontinental Resort on the Vietnamese island of Phu Quoc. Oh, and thanks for watching until the end.